code, we can do a selfie in the meantime. <laughs> also, proper form of giving a lecture on social media. <clears throat> It's a safe place. Okay. Some of the rest of you may, but not be willing to raise your hand. How many of you use Twitter? <coughs> Growing number. It used to be like two people in the room, but we're, we're making progress slowly but surely. All right. Um, we're going to talk today about pathology research via Facebook and Twitter. You know, I give a lot of a lot of lectures about. Uh, social media and why we should be involved and, and the benefits for your career. But I want to talk specifically today about the research aspect. There is actually research you can do. You can use social media as a tool to enhance the research you're doing. This is not a real paper. This is just me trying to be clever uh, with uh, <laughs> mutilating PubMed. But, but hopefully one day there'll be some more papers on PubMed uh, about social media. If I have anything to do with it. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about briefly what is social media. Because we throw that term around a lot, but I think a lot of people are not familiar with what it really is. You know, it's a, it's a thing that gets politicians in trouble, and um, sometimes uh, famous personalities for tweeting nude selfies and things like that. But you know, there's there's a lot more to it than just than just that. And uh, down here, I, for those of you who are new to social media, I have a little online guide so you can snap a picture of the screen here and go look at that later if you're thinking about getting involved. And if you want to follow me, that's my uh, Twitter name. And then this is the hashtag. I did not come up with another cable video. It sounds like I'm like, being very self-promoting, but, but Dr. Cagle actually was the one who came up with that, so I'll blame him for calling it garden rounds, although I did think it was clever. So, so we're going to talk about using social media to get published. And there's a variety of things that you can do that will have impact actually on your CV. Um, number one, you can promote papers that you already have published, that you've published through traditional means, and that you can just get the word out about those papers. You can talk about new collaborations, all sorts of ways that you can spawn new collaborations with people uh, that you might never have met otherwise to do research and, and have other partnerships via social media. We're going to talk about how you can publish about the act of using social media itself, about social media use in pathology, and there's actually very, like almost no publications on that. So it's the kind of stuff that's easy to get published because there's no precedent. You're, you're, you're setting the precedent here. And then finally, we're going to talk about using social media as a tool for conducting kind of more formal, traditional research, like all of us do, clinical pathologic research, that you can use social media to enhance and magnify the effects and the strength of your studies that you're already designing. And then we'll also talk, because I know already you're thinking, at least the, the more seasoned pathologists are like, but won't I get sued, right? This is what people always ask. People interrupt me in the middle of talks about social media and say, but what about HIPAA? But won't I get sued? And I was like, oh, I've never thought of that. No, actually, I have thought of that. I think about this stuff every day because I get questions about this. And we'll talk about that briefly, too. All right, so what is social media? Social media is a name for a group of websites that allow users, individuals like you and me, to create content and to exchange content with one another and interact about that content. You post a picture of your kids and people click like or comment and say, oh, my daughter's the same age. It's that interactiveness and the ability to post your own content that makes social media social media, right? So a lot of us think, well, you know, there's just pictures of baby pandas or kittens or Kim Kardashian, and those are all things that are on social media, true. Kim, Kim is actually the most followed person on Twitter. I think she has 15 million followers or something. I don't know what that says about our society or culture, but, but it's the truth. And she's actually a very savvy um, person at, at marketing herself and at branding. So she actually knows what she's doing. Uh, she didn't just happen to be a famous. Pathologists could take a page from her book, honestly. And so, um, true. 
but not all pages. <laughs> Maybe not this, the new selfie ones. Okay, so websites that allow users to, and individuals to create and exchange content, right? That content can also be pathology pictures. Look at those beautiful Wagner Meister corpuses. Isn't that gorgeous? I love soft tissue too. Okay, and there's uh, there's a cool little Molina site. It's a little inclusion. I think that's fun to do. And that's a tick. Every once in a while they get biopsy too. It's delightful to show the med students. Right? And then there's also people that create artistic stuff. I know some of you have seen this slide before, and that's that's not mine. And people can give me credit. This, no way. I'm not a Photoshop master at all. This guy, I heard just uh, amazing. That's amazing path art. He finds artistic works of pathology, kind of sees patterns in tissue that other people wouldn't, and kind of you know derives some artistic aesthetic benefit out of uh, pathology. You know, and then also you know. You can you know use your your babies for self promotion too, and my kids will be devastated when they learn I've been using them for marketing since birth. But this picture goes up more like than any other picture I think that I've ever posted on social media because it's my baby Gabby who's now seven months old. And look, I put her on top of books by my favorite mentors, Ron Rapini's book, Sharon Weiss's book. I mean, it's pretty good stuff, right? Even Dr. Rapini said that was kind of cool. He just said as long as there are clean diapers involved. <laughs> Social media is just another type of media, right? It's easy to, to label it or brand it, but it's the same thing as newspaper or, or so any sort of media. The difference is that instead of an editor making up the content, you make up the content that's on your own site. You're in charge. You're your own editor, basically. So the content's up to you. No one's going like, to force you to put weird stuff on your social media. You're in charge of it, okay? You have to be responsible. That's hard for some people. Infrastructure of social media, of Facebook and Twitter, allows interactions that resemble real life, and they can be done at, on anyone's time over distance. So I interact with people in India. It would be hard to like set up phone calls with these people because they're on the opposite side of the world, right? In the time zones, I'd be waking up at three in the morning. But instead, when they wake up, they post something. I wake up the next day. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And we have these conversations that are ongoing. And the way the infrastructure of these websites allow that kind of natural interaction, it really resembles real life. I know people think, oh, you're just playing with your phone, but there's a real person on the other side of that connection that's having an interaction with you. And, you know, some of these people I've met online and, and got to know online, and when I meet them in real life, it's like I've known them for years, even though we've never met face-to-face. -face. Jonathan Boyd, I saw the other day, and I was like, well, we never met in person. He's like, we did last year at TSP, and I realized the line between real life and social media for me is blurred. And maybe you don't want to get to that point, or maybe you do. <laughs> but then I thought about it, that what's real life? I mean, this is, there are real people. You're having real conversations that are meaningful. Why is it any different just because it's through electronic means uh, than face-to-face? -face? And it augments, it doesn't replace in-person interaction, okay? You know, I know, as much as I like tweeting and doing all this, I don't want to be glued to my phone all the time. When I'm with people, I want to talk to people and have fun with them. You know, I, I don't just, just use my phone all the time. I know you guys don't believe that, but it's true. <laughs> so interaction between users is the key to what makes it social. So I use social media in a wide variety of ways, as many of you know, but we're going to talk about the last one. We're going to talk about research and what we can do that's actually, you know, formal research. What we can do that promotion and tenure committees will get on board. So I gave this talk recently, or not this talk, but a talk on social media for um, a faculty development seminar a couple months ago at my university. And the associate dean in charge of promotion and tenure attended. And she actually was kind of like interested and she's like, well, I'm kind of scared still, but but she just sent me an email the other day and said, can you help set up some profiles for our research institute people? And maybe I'll let you like set me up with Twitter on my phone to so see we're making progress slowly. Slowly, we'll convince the senior people one by one. So how can you use social media to promote the publications you already have? Many of you already have lots of publications out there, right? And you write a case report, and it's been viewed like by your mom and three other people, right? And cited once, maybe if you're lucky, right? Well, you can share links to your publication with your followers. I have 5,000 followers on Twitter. So if I tweet a link, I mean, a fair number of people will see it. A few of them might actually follow it and say, oh, this is kind of a cool paper that's relevant to something I'm interested in. They may never have found it otherwise in the flood of information that's out there, but I'm directing them to it, right? Is that self-promotion? Yeah, I mean, that's the point of academics, right? And people have accused me of that. Well, you're self-promoting. And I was like, aren't we supposed to, like, CV build? And isn't that, like, the whole point of, like, getting promoted since you have to have a growing national reputation and then a growing international reputation? So you do have to balance it. You can't just, just talk yourself up and have no content. But if you have good content, you know, sharing that with other people so that they see what you're up to, that's beneficial. And it's not just beneficial to your career. You're going to get to meet people that will be like, wow, this is so cool. We have a lot in common. Let's work together and, and you know, do something. And that will benefit the future of medicine and eventually can benefit patients. And that's the whole point, right? So 
you know, Facebook and Twitter also have free analytic tools that allow you to, to track how many people are seeing your posts, how many people are clicking on the link and following it through to see the, you know, your article or whatever it is you're sharing. And it's really cool, those analytic tools are totally free and they're the kind of stuff that really give you a better understanding of your, your market, basically, because it is, you're marketing yourself to a group of people. So here's an example of a paper I wrote with Nicole Riddle uh, recently, who's on Twitter and I've known for a long time. So we, we give a little throwback to the 90s, any of you who get the name, that's fun. So um, it's about new soft tissue tumors and new molecular findings. So we tweeted that out um, with, a, a, with a picture of one of the, the tables of all the new molecular. And here it is, there's a table, and we sent that out and said, oh, cool, check this out. And that was viewed 7,000 times. And 84 people followed the link and clicked through at least to the abstract. That doesn't mean they downloaded or read the whole article, but at least they know this article exists. They know that I'm publishing about soft tissue, that I've collaborated with Nicole Riddle, that there's all these new findings, that I wrote a paper about it. They might pull this article later. I don't know. I don't know for sure, but, but that's not bad, right? This article would have potentially languished. I think it's a good article. We worked hard on it. It's got some nice pictures and stuff, but it might have never gotten discovered, right? Just sitting in a journal that a lot of people maybe don't have access to. Like my university doesn't subscribe to this journal. So I actually had to get a copy of this from the, the editor directly, rather than from my university website. And Facebook's the same way, it gives you analytic tools as well. So this is my Facebook page, and you can share pictures of you know, secondary peripheral chondrosarcomas or whatnot, you know, as one does um, in their spare time. <laughs> okay, this explains a lot about why I don't have friends. But anyway, um, also I have three babies, that also helps. So. Um, you can do that and see, look, it says that 23,000 people have seen your post this week, and this many people have liked your page, or this many people have unliked your page. You can get all that kind of granular data and find out how your audience is responding to what you're sharing. So here's an example with that post. There's a cool video of white blood, you know, eosinophils attacking a worm, 33,000 views in a short period of time. So you can really see like what kind of stuff is interesting to people how, and get this, and there's more granular detail than that actually. You can see what kind of people hit the post or reported as spam or unliked your page or whatever. You can see how people are responding to what you're posting. So it can be links to articles, it can be other types of content too. But that analytic act, I mean, most publishers don't give you access to that. They don't let you know how many people are looking at your article. Like ResearchGate does, right? It was just kind of a social media research. We're not gonna really talk about that today, but it's a great site too. And you know, but, but publishers don't usually give you that. PubMed doesn't give you that. They only release that information to the publisher directly. They don't give you those kind of information. So you can go around them and find that information on your own in a different sort of way. See, I, I mentioned yesterday, the publishing industry in many ways is, is relatively behind the times. And they need to change or they're going to die. Or they're going to at least be crippled in a way that they didn't expect. And I don't mean that detrimentally, I just mean that they, they need to modify themselves and find a way to adapt to new technologies and new ways of giving content. So I'll give you a little bit of backstory throughout to explain the next parts of what I'm talking about. So in 2013, I started two pathology groups on Facebook. I had thought about starting a blog or a website before, and I thought it's too much work, and I don't really know that much about website coding. Um, so I decided I'd start these discussion groups. Facebook allows you to create groups that you can be in control of and have administrative rights over, and people can join and, and post things and comment. And it's actually really brilliant because the interact again, the, the, these guys know what they're doing, okay? There are a billion people daily that access Facebook. It's unbelievable. It's hard to even fathom that number of people using one website. They know what they're doing. No one's gonna make a better system than them. They're, they're almost like too big to fail in a way. I know people say that all the time, but it's kind of true. So I started these groups about skin and a dirt path and bone and soft tissue tumors uh, pathology. But here we are two and a half years later and we have 20,000 members in the dirt path group and 18,000 members in the, the soft tissue group. And at the last count, like last fall, I counted this up for a project that we'll talk about later. Five to 800 cases have been posted on these groups, most of them by other people, not by me, and have these real robust discussions. This was a turning point in my career. It was at this point when I was two months in and had like 3,000 members already that I was like, wow, this is something. This is what people want to see and want to do. And this is something that people have not been doing this before. There are not, not many, there were some other groups that prior to mine, uh, but, but most people didn't know about this. And I realized this is, this is what I need to be investing my time in. And here's an example of the, you know, the bone and soft tissue group. And I think, see, at that time there's 17,000 members. Maybe we just are about to hit 18,000 now. And here's you know, an example of an atypical lipomish tumor right, that's posted. And, and here's the discussion. And look at this, 84 comments. 
I mean, this is the kind of robust discussion that we want to have at medical meetings, but we don't because we'll say there's time for one question and then two minutes until the next presenter, right? But here online, over time, from anyone's spare time, when I'm feeding my baby a bottle in the middle of the night, I can read over these comments and try to stay awake while I'm typing and do MDM2 or whatever, right? And so, so this, is, this is really cool, right? That you can have this really robust discussion. It's a great learning environment. And you say, well, we're not here for education. How do you get published a lot of this? We'll get there. So collaborations can arise out of these groups and out of meeting people on Twitter and on Facebook. Okay, so you can find and interact with others who share your research interests. Um, especially on Twitter, it's a great way to meet people that are outside your sphere that you would never have met otherwise. I've met radiologists, like neuroradiologists, who had very similar educational interests. And even though I don't do brain tumors and she doesn't do soft tissue tumors, and I would never have gone to the same meetings, but we, she's like the radiology version of me. Um, it's kind of sad for her, but still, I mean, she said it, not me. So. Um, anyway, that's Jenny Wong. She she created this thing called Rad Path Match, where someone will tweet a pathology image and she'll tweet a corresponding radiology image to match with it. It's an amazing tool for learning and enhancing collaboration between radiologists and pathologists. So you can find you know formal collaborations this way. And, you know the old way was you just emailed your pathologist buddies, or I don't know what people did before email, sent letters or something, or met at meetings. I'm not really sure, honestly. But, but somehow you ask your, your group of people, right, and say, well, hey, does anyone have an example of this? I'm trying to put together a study, and I need 10 cases. And now you just post a request on the Facebook group of 20,000 people and see who's interested, right? You still have to get formal IRB approval. You, you still have to go through the normal channels. But you can use this huge, huge pool of people to get a lot more done and a lot more bang for your buck. Conversations on social media and posts by others stimulate ideas for new research. All the time I'll read something like, oh, that's really awesome. We can totally apply that to pathology. And so I get a lot of ideas and maybe too many ideas. I don't have time for any more things. But still, I continue to find new things and new ideas of, of what we could be doing maybe better by seeing what other people are doing, maybe even uh, in other fields. Like, you know, there's, there's a journal club, the, the nephrologist do journal club um, on, on social media. And they'll have a time where they meet for like an hour and they tweet an article and then they discuss it over Twitter. And so, you know, how do you get people together at 8 o'clock at night? Everyone's busy. But people can sit down at home, you know, after dinner or whatever, and they can do that and learn and have amazing discussions. So, you know, we don't do that pathology yet. Maybe we should. I don't have time to run that, but maybe one of you do. And then you can crowdsource. You can find junior people to help you write papers. I knew many of you were looking for that, right? So one year I had 15 abstracts that were accepted at the American Society of Dermat. That ended up being a lot more work than I thought it would be editing all those abstracts and posters. But a lot of those people I found were people that were friends on social media. I posted and said, hey, does anyone want to write up something? And I had cases that were ready, and I gave them de-identified data, and they, they wrote it up, and um, it was cool. You can also find rare images for book chapters or papers. You can find cases to add into a, a study you're doing to increase your sample size. Crowdsourcing is a really powerful thing that you can do. Uh, when you have a group of 20,000 pathologists at your fingertips, you can do an amazing amount of things. So let me show you an example of collaboration. Kisuke Goto is a pathologist in Japan. He posted this beautiful case of spargonosis. I mean, if you're a dermapath and you're interested in weird infections like me, this is just glorious, right? And I was like, Kisuke, we have to like, write that up as a little thing that's really cool. So we did, and I collaborated. I got Gina Johnson, who is a resident I knew at Emory, who's, um, uh, who worked on writing this up. Kisuki and his clinical colleague in Japan, um, and then me in Arkansas, and from you know two continents and, and three different places, we wrote up this paper that got published on the cover of the journal Cutaneous Pathology as a little quizlet. And it worked out well because Gina's going to be my fellow next year in Durpath at Arkansas, so it worked out well for her too. And it also worked out well for me because perhaps for the only time in publishing history, through a glitch in the publishing system, I'm not sure they're excited about me telling this, but I will anyway, um, this, note the dates here, that's January 2015, and there's March, it was accidentally put on the cover uh, two different months. So very few people noticed this, but I noticed it and have kept this picture again for posterity. Now I did only put it on my CV one time, but I did put C also, separate so I think it's fair. So I made sure that the dean of the charge of promotion and tenure knew I'm not cheating, but I will have that second reference just because it's cool. So it's kind of cool, right? So anyway. Crowdsourcing. What do we mean by this? That's when you get a group of people to kind of help you accomplish a task, and you kind of share the workload among a group of people who are interested. You know, more senior people, people that are further in their career, often have a lot more on their plate. Junior people are anxiously looking for things to do. You all know this, right? They're always like, please give me a case to write up. I want to be a dramatic pathologist. Poor Dr. Rapini knows. I was one of those people once. So 
say, a, a, this is actually a true story, a colleague of mine who issues social media and hates it and thinks it's like, well, we won't go there, but she doesn't really like it, but she does recognize its power now because she said, I need a clinical image of a hydronome papilliferum for a book chapter that she was writing. Well, I didn't have one. I had plenty of pathology images, but I didn't have a clinical image. So I posted a request on my neuropath group. I said, well, we'll see if someone else does. So here's my request. And note the time there, 11.57 AM on February the 3rd. Okay, I said, does anyone have a picture of a hydronoma or, or maybe a topic press we're looking for that too? And then here's an email response I got on February 3rd at 12.20. So 33 minutes later, a picture, maybe not a picture that most people want to see, but a picture that was exactly what she was looking for 33 minutes after I posted. It took me 10 seconds or 30 seconds to make that post. And I sent her an email that afternoon and said, yeah, Juan Carlos Garces from, uh, from uh, Ecuador has a picture of this work. And she was like, yes, that's awesome. I'm so excited. She was happy with me. She was happy with Juan Carlos. Juan Carlos got cited in her book. Everyone was happy. And it took me like 30 seconds of time. Wow. Crowdsourcing. See, this is winning the game, guys. This is me getting credit for doing very little because I know I'm willing to post something on Facebook and other people aren't. Junior people, take heed. You think that they hired me to be deputy editor-in-chief? Well, I don't get paid, but you think they appointed me to be deputy editor-in-chief because of my, my senior level of distinguished reason? No, it's because I know how to do Twitter and Facebook. Maybe Phil's going to keep a straight face, but we all know it's true. It's okay. So more backstory. In 2015, last year, I thought maybe we should do an organized attempt at live tweeting the use community and get people together. So live tweeting, you take pictures of, like some of you are doing here, Martin's probably doing it right now. You take a picture and say, oh, you know, Dr. Dr. Rapini says that this stain's good for this, or, or all immunostains are, you know, overused, or whatever, whatever kind of thing one says, you know, when they give a talk. And then you tweet that and share it with your followers. So people who aren't at the meeting can kind of keep up with what's there. And I, I've been home from a meeting once because I had a sick kid, and it was great. I felt like I was able to follow along and be there. And some of my colleagues from around the world that have very little money and very little access, for them, this is the only access they'll ever get to an American medical meeting. And that was really shocking to me to, to meet and get to know some of those people who get paid so little that they can't even pay the abstract fee, which is it's shocking. I mean, I can't really even wrap my head around that. But to those people, this is amazing. And we think, well, they have all this stuff on the internet. They don't have access to journals. They don't have universities that give them paid access, right? We are spoiled. We have so much and so much content that we don't even know what to do with it. And there are people in other countries that are doing their best to, to make do. And they need this kind of stuff. They need these kind of pearls uh, from the cutting edge of what's happening at meetings. Some of the times they'll say, I've never even heard of this tumor before. So see, we're making a difference. So we organized this group for USCAP 15. And so this is a hashtag. We, we, this, this link explains all this stuff. But a hashtag is real simple. It's not a pound sign, it's a hashtag, okay? And a hashtag is just a topic. So if you go on Twitter and you click hashtag USCAP2015, you can see every tweet that has that hashtag in it. So it's a way to help you sort out the noise and just find the stuff that you're looking for. If you want to find stuff about Dermpath, you click hashtag Dermpath, and it will bring up every tweet that has that hashtag in it. So it's like a searchable little topic title that you can apply to tweets. So that's all it is. Hashtags aren't that, aren't that scary. And then at, those are people. Those are people on, on Twitter. If you have an at sign in front of your name on, on Twitter or on Instagram, that's like your name. And if you click that, you'll see that person's account and all the stuff they've posted. All right? So here's what we uh, what we did. I, I tweeted out and said, hey, does anyone want to help organize a, a live tweet group? And we got a bunch of responses. So I talked to the head of USCAP, David Kaminsky, who is the new executive vice president, and said, are you guys interested in this? Is this cool? And they said, yeah, this sounds really exciting. Let's do it. He's a very forward-thinking guy, very interested in innovation, which is He's the, the right guy for USCAP. He's been amazing, I think, for the organization. So we put together this, and they made this real nice little poster for us, and I, I wrote in some famous people like Phil Cagle and Jennifer Hunt, who are on Twitter, and I said, let's let's do this. I said, even if you tweet like three times, just so I can put your picture on there and legitimize what we're doing, it'll be fine. And they actually tweeted a lot more than that, I was pleased to say, because once you're on like a poster, you feel like, well, I guess I've got to do this, you know, so you feel a little obligation. See, that's how we do things. So it's the guilt method. Anyway, so we put this group together, and so there's this website called Simpler that lets you track healthcare hashtag usage. So we tracked the USCAP 2015 hashtag to see how many people were tweeting about it. And look, at the peak, we got, whoops. At the peak, we were getting uh, almost 2,000 tweets a day on the top day of the meeting. That's cool. For a pathology meeting, I mean, this was a record. This was nothing like this had been done before. All these people participated in it. It was really amazing. And at the end, you can get statistics and see how many tweets have been there, how many times those tweets have been viewed. How many people were the top tweeting people? And look at this, 5.8 million views of tweets about USCAP 2015. So I sent this picture right here to David Kaminsky and the leadership of USCAP, and a couple days later they're like, we want you to run USCAP uh, social media, please. And please make a committee and like do this full time. 
because that is powerful. This costs nothing, right? That's free. That just takes manpower. And we got more views about it. Again, it's a pathology thing. It's not Kim Kardashian, okay? We're talking about <laughs> random weird tumors and what to call follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer or whatever it's called now. There's new letters every year. I don't know. That's why I don't do ENT stuff because of the thyroid. And also this famous dysplasia, which I can't stand in the mouth. It's very scary. So anyway. Sorry, I go off on tangents. My wife says the difference, I, I always think I have tangential thought. But she said, no, you're not schizophrenic, you have circumferential thought. It comes back to your point. It may be 30 minutes, but I'll get back to it. My wife's a psychiatrist, so she should have that. I use her as a joke in every lecture I give. She says it's okay. So I have informed consent from her. So anyway, there were 6,000 tweets about the meeting. So that's pretty cool stuff, right? So like I said, I, I run social media use cap, uh, for USCAP now, and I have a group of people that help me do that. And so for USCAP 2016, for this year, we just had that meeting in Seattle, we wanted to make kind of a more robust live tweet process. So here's what we did this year. 18,000 tweets, 27 million views, one year later. That's unbelievable. I was, I couldn't believe it. Like on the first day of the meeting, we were at like 5 million views already. I was just, I was like, this is new territory. I don't even know what to expect. I still can't believe it. Twitter is relevant. If that doesn't give it to you that this is relevant and this is something that we should be at least interested in figuring out how to do, even if you don't want to do it yourself, but recognizing that your program should be on Twitter, your journal should be on Twitter, you should probably be on Twitter. I mean, if that doesn't convince you, there's nothing I can say that will. Oh, and look, Marin, Methodist resident, she's killing it, man. She almost, almost is up there with me. I mean, you know, I mean I'm pretty fast, so I've got competition. All right. So you can also publish about the use of social media for pathology. So David Cohen, who's also here at Methodist, and I, and I, we're writing a paper actually about our whole experience with organizing USCAP social media and the whole insight to pathologist live tweeting experience. We're going to have that published as an editorial monitor of pathology. And we surveyed all of the people who were involved in that first group last year in 2015 um, to kind of get some data from them, the pros and cons, would they do it again? And everyone loved it. Everyone said this is a really cool experience to get to, to do this. Right? And again, no one's publishing about this. There are like almost no articles to even cite in the pathology literature. Tim Allen's written an article on Twitter, a, a short piece in, in archives. There are a few other things, but there's not much. So that's the kind of stuff that's easy to get published, right? Because journals recognize, oh, that's social media stuff. We need to get involved. So you write a paper and like put Twitter or Facebook anywhere in it, they'll say, oh, yeah, we should probably publish it. Just junior guys, just, just tell me. So going back to the group, remember this group, right? Well, there are other groups. There's a GI, liver, pancreatic pathology group. Uh, Ron DeAntis um, and Joel Greenson started, and I have a Dermpath group, and I have a little editorial board that helps me manage it. Um, a GI pathology group that Raul Gonzalez uh, started, which now has more, I told him he should start this group, but now he has more members than I do, so I don't know why people like GI pathology so much, but anyway, the surgical pathology, there are all these groups, and so you say, well, again, what is it, and that's the oldest group, that Sadiqa Mary, who lives in, um, in, uh, the, um, in Dubai, I think is where he is now, or no, I'm sorry, he's in Saudi Arabia, from Yemen. But he started this group in 2009. It's got 32,000 members. This is the oldest and biggest group on uh, Facebook. So why am I telling you about this? Well, Raul uh, and I are writing up a paper now, and it's in the final stages of editing, where we surveyed all the, the, the admins of these groups to kind of get like the pros and cons of running a group, how you manage you know, difficult people, how you manage spam, all of that. So we're writing up a paper, actually, to be published in the peer-reviewed literature about how to have a discussion group on Facebook about pathology. No one has ever published that before. I'm also working on a paper with Aaron Carlquist, who's a PATH resident in South Alabama. I'm gonna be a DermPath fellow um, in, the sh in the near future. And we're writing a paper, we did a survey of uh, users to see how do people use social media to educate themselves about DermPath in particular. And we presented this at the ASDP last year as a poster. So we did a survey via Twitter and Facebook, and we got 131 people from 29 countries to respond to that survey within like, I think, 10 days, I think we had it out there. It's not too bad, right? 81% of them are in kind of the 25 to 45 year old range. Most of them use Facebook or Twitter several times per day. And most of them use it both for professional and for, for personal purposes, for social personal purposes. Most of them agreed that it was relevant to their practice, that they obtained knowledge that was useful for their actual clinical practice by seeing cases posted. Um, not necessarily better than the medical literature, but about half of them actually said that they found it more useful than the medical literature. That's kind of shocking, right? Whether that's good or bad or whether that should be the way it is is not the point. The point is, is this is what people are actually doing in practice and in real life. And we need to understand this better so that we can modify what we're doing and so that we can modify the literature and make it more accessible too. And most people said they want more DermPath on 
on social media. They want to see more of this. They want to have more experts on social media. They want more senior level, famous third paths on social media so they can interact with them and learn from them too. Senior famous people here, you want to have an impact on the junior generation. How much time do you have to mentor them? How much time do you really have to sit down and teach? You want to, right? And you do the most you can, but it's hard to schedule 30 minutes out of your day when you have a bunch, bunch of cases and the residents have all these meetings they have to go to about sleep deprivation and stuff like that, right, to keep the GME office happy. You guys know what I'm talking about. And then um, and, and this is a great way. You can spend a little bit of time, you know, when you're standing in line at the grocery store responding to a question from a resident. This is a way to, to have relevance to the next generation. And I know that the more senior people get, the less and less they care about how many lines they have on their CV. And the more they care about the future of pathology and about raising up a generation of strong pathologists to take over in the years to come. And to, to make sure that they pass that on to the next generation too. This is a way to have relevance to the junior generation. Right, some more backstory. And now we're going to talk about kind of the most relevant and to me the most important part of, of everything that I've done with social media. This is the thing I would choose and I would give up everything else. I joined a DFSP support group, a patient support group in 2014. Now I'm not, as you can imagine, I'm not a very hesitant person and I'm also not a total rule follower, kind of, but I was still a little scared when I did this. I thought, should I do this? Am I going to get in trouble? Am I going to cause harm to patients? Is it okay for me to talk to these people directly? It's a group of patients with DFSP, with a sarcoma from the skin, that I'm pretty familiar with and have an interest in. So here's what happened. When I joined, this lady right here, this is Pip Kaliskin, and she has publicly talked about, done interviews about her tumor. She had DFSP on her forehead. About 30% of patients actually have DFSP on the head and neck. It's a bad place to have it, as you can see, because she had an enormous part of her scalp removed in like the 90s. So she just recently had a reconstruction, and I still, she's not released the final pictures yet, it's still healing, but after 20 years, she's finally been deemed as cured. But she had about, I think, nine surgeries or 10 surgeries, five or six recurrences. You know, people told her, oh, don't worry, this is a good kind of cancer. Don't tell patients DFSP is a good cancer. Just because it doesn't metastasize often, that's not good, right? That's morbid. And that's what I learned from these patients. I had told people, oh, this is a good kind of cancer, but these people taught me, don't say that, because that's really insulting to us, and it really minimizes what we're going through as patients. But what Pip told me when I joined the group is, um, she said, she started this group in 2008, so what, six years before I joined. And she said, you're the first doctor, in fact, the first medical professional of any sort who joined our group and asked us what we thought or what we felt about our disease. And I consider that an enormous turning point, not only in my career, but in my life. To that, I will never look back, I will never look at this disease or other rare diseases the same way again. Because there was, I've learned so, I joined this group to educate these people about their disease, to answer questions about margins and what Mohs surgery is and stuff like that. And I do that, but I've learned so much more from them about what their experience is. And I will never look at that disease the same way again. I'm much more cautious now about not missing DFSP. It's made me more paranoid, if anything, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's how it is. But Pip told me that, and I was just blown away. I thought, that's, that's so hard to believe. How many of you before today knew that there are actually groups of patients on Facebook meeting with each other and talking about their disease? So a few of you, but most doctors don't. Most doctors have no idea. They don't know that they should be referring their patients to these groups, not for medical advice, but for support from other people. How do you explain DFSP to your family? Was it skin cancer? Well, not really. No, it's a sarcoma. Was well, it going to metastasize your lung? Well, it's a low risk. I mean, it's really hard to explain, right? The other people in this group, they get it. They know exactly what it's like. They know what it's like. They know what their doctors feel about it and how their doctors don't understand it. They know how their family doesn't understand it. They have an amazing amount of social support through these groups, not to mention information medically because many of the patients are very sad. So after this, it was a very good experience and I, I really enjoyed working with them. So I joined multiple groups. So I'm in an angiosarc group, a helium sarcoma, <coughs> a couple of angiosarcoma groups, and some others that I'm not as active in. I mean, you can't do everything, right? Well, I think that I can, but my wife says you can do anything, but not everything. I'm starting to think she's probably right because um, <clears throat> I'm running out of sleep to cut out at night. There's only so many hours, you know. So let's talk about being involved in patient groups. I join to educate these people. But won't I get sued, right? Won't I cause harm? Won't I, won't I, won't I, won't I? I get these questions, and I understand. I was there too, I had the same questions myself. And like I said, I'm someone who likes to innovate and kind of push the boundaries, and I still felt that way. So I understand that people that are more traditional are gonna feel really scared about this. If you're afraid to like even post on social media at all, getting involved in a patient group is like jumping way off the deep end, right? These patients have cancer. Many of them have bad cancer. You are not going to harm them, okay? By help telling them when they should go, you know, hey, you should, you know, this is probably not a big deal, but you should really go back and double check with your doctor. You've minimized their stress, but also directed them back to their doctor. 
that's a big help to that patient, right? Again, it's not like looking at a mole on someone and saying, don't worry, that's probably benign. That's risky, don't do that, okay? But looking at people that have cancer and helping them navigate the medical system or better understand their pathology, better understand the role of pathologists in diagnosing and in patient care, I mean, how is that bad? Also, pathologists know how to hedge, right? Come on. I know, I, I get a lot more laughs when I give this talk to non-pathologist audience, but you all know it's straight down in your heart, right? You know how to say exactly what you mean, no more and no less. You know how to give useful information when you need to without being de definitive when you can't. When you can't be definitive, but you can give some information that will help guide what happens, you can do that. I can say, you know, I'm not totally sure, but here's one thing I would talk to your doctor about. Ask them about this versus this. You know, if your doctor seems unfamiliar, you might seek a second opinion. None of those things are, I mean, the chance of getting sued over that to me seems minuscule, if any. I, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any pathologist who's been sued for comments on social media. I've heard of a few doctors that had to settle out of suits. I don't know the details because they were giving like really blatantly inappropriate things that they were saying, but I still don't even know much about that. The chances of getting sued on social media, I think, are very low. I mean, could it happen? Sure, but you can get sued for anything, right? You can get sued because someone falls down on your sidewalk coming up to, to deliver some spam you know, to your door about you know, redoing your roof or something. Also, our role is not as treating physicians not even as a physician to the patient. There's no doctor-patient relationship, and you have to make sure that that's clear. You are there as a content expert, you know about the disease, and as a patient advocate, an advocate for their disease, a champion of their disease, someone who will take the information that they're telling you and share that with audiences that are medical and help other, other providers better understand that disease. You're not their doctor. Occasionally, patients will send me a consult, and then I tell them, now I'm your doctor, now we can talk, now I can give you advice, now I can call your surgeon and tell them something, but until that point happens, there's no doctor-patient relationship here. And finally, think about this. You take real medical legal risks every day. When I come to work and decide nevus versus melanoma 30 times a day, I'm taking a risk, not only a risk that I'll be wrong against you, but a risk that I can harm patients in real life. That's real risk, but why don't I fear going to work every day? Because it's risk that is common. It's risk that I've come to accept as part of my job, as part of my everyday life. It doesn't seem scary, it doesn't seem weird and rare. Facebook seems kind of like, ooh, I don't know about all that social media stuff, I see it on the news. It's not common, it's not familiar, and therefore it seems more scary than it actually is. We take real risk every day and we accept it. And people say, well, that's your job, you have to. Do I have to? No, Mary Schwartz told me once, if you don't wanna get sued, don't be a doctor. And I think that's actually, I mean, that's blatant, but it's the hard truth. If you're really that worried about the legal risk, there are safer professions out there that we could do. I could change and I could do a different job than I do now. But I do this because I want to take care of patients. And I do this because I think that it really is the future of what pathologists can do for patients, the future of research, and because I've seen the dramatic impact that it can have on the lives of these patients whose lives have been shattered by rare tumors that I know about that most of their doctors don't because of my research interests and because of my background in soft tissue pathology. And there are other rare diseases outside of soft tissue tumors rare lymphomas, and I joined a mycosis lymphoides group recently. Most doctors don't understand mycosis lymphoides. Most oncologists don't really understand mycosis lymphoides. And these patients are starting to pick up on that. There are so many diseases, and I'm one guy, but there are tons and tons of experts out there that could be making an impact here. All right, so how do you use social media? This is the way you guys really came here. How do you use it to conduct formal research? Well, let me tell you another little story. This fibrosarcoma is DFSB. Behave worse than regular DFSP. This is kind of a higher grade transformation that happens sometimes in DFSP. And a patient asked me this soon after I joined the group, and I said, well, you know, the literature is kind of unclear. I said, there are some studies that say, yeah, it's about 15% risk of metastasis. I've only seen one case of metastatic DFSP, and I'm getting close to have seen 100 cases probably in my, my short career so far, probably 75 to 100, somewhere in there. Not that many fibrous sarcomas ones, but plenty of those. And I said, but you know, my mentor did a study and found that there was no higher risk if you treat it with wide margins. And so there's kind of a debate. And the guy said, well, why don't you study us? There are like, at that point, there were like 700 of the DFSP patients in the group, and many of them have fibrous sarcomas DFSP. So it was that question that really kind of spawned all of this. I thought, that's a cool idea. My IRB is going to freak out, right, when I tell them I want to ask IRB question. So what about the IRB, right? That's another question you have. Really, how are you going to, what about HIPAA? What about the IRB? Can you really do research with Facebook? Then isn't that crazy? Maybe. Will they freak out? Quite possibly. My IRB did not. And that's because someone, I didn't realize until later, someone about a year before me had already proposed the idea, and she actually founded a group, she's a genetic counselor, who found a patient with a rare, really rare syndrome that's fatal if not treated, and through Facebook they found another patient who's undiagnosed, and they started a foundation, and she's on the, the board, and they have saved lives of patients who were otherwise totally undiagnosed. It's a disease with like 100 cases ever, some weird genetic thing. And um, like, 
I need a facial, I don't feel like you're seeing me. But they, she had to kind of pave the way, so I didn't realize that until later, and I was very thankful. But you, you have to meet with them first. That's what I said. I was like, before I even waste my time writing this up, can we like talk about this because I don't want to waste the time? And they're like, yeah, sure, we'll come to your office. So three people from the IRB came to my office, and they were like, when I told them a patient came up with this idea, they, were, they said, that's, that's patient-centered research. And I was like, what's that? And they're like, oh, this is a hot new thing. There's all this funding. We can help get you funded. And I thought, well, you're from the IRB. You're talking about getting me funded. Aren't you guys supposed to be a roadblock and make my life more difficult? And I mean, <laughs> you laugh, but I mean, you know, we often feel that way, and sometimes it's true. And I understand they have an important role. I'm not trying to minimize that, but but that was my kind of negative, pessimistic view about IRBs. They kind of changed my opinion. Our, our IRB at UAMS actually changed my opinion because they took the time to meet with me and to actually help me accomplish my research goals. And they partnered me with a PhD in, um, in nursing who had experience with collaborating with rare disease groups, with alpha-1 antitrypsin patients. Not so much on the medical side, but more on the kind of social life burden of having a rare disease and what it means to suffer from a rare disease that other people have never heard of. So it's made, been a great partnership that we'll talk about in a second. So instead of raging at your IRB, which is very tempting to do, but probably won't be effective, help them understand. Build a rapport with them and help explain to them. You might have to simply explain to them what Facebook is and the fact that when they talk about HIPAA, you know, those patients are posting on a public website that they have a rare cancer. There, there's no privacy thing there. Yeah, you still have to respect and not share that beyond where they would want it to be shared. But there, it's not HIPAA. HIPAA is between a provider and a covered entity, right? I mean, like that's what HIPAA says. HIPAA is just the law. I follow HIPAA not because I care about HIPAA, because I don't want to get in trouble with the law and I don't want to find. What I care about is patient privacy and confidentiality. That's the overarching ethical principle that truly matters. And that's what I'm always going to respect. I follow the letter of the law to not get in trouble. But I care about patient confidentiality way, way more than some rule that people have made up that's kind of you know tangled and messed up. Patient privacy is what matters, but many of these patients have already posted this on a public website that's not HIPAA compliant. So you have to kind of help the IRB understand this. It may take multiple conversations. Don't give up. You'll also be paving the way for future researchers who want to do this. All right, having patient buy-in, or the fact that a patient even suggested this, is enormously important. So I didn't go to this group and say, hey guys, I want to do this big research project on you. I spent time, I invested time with them, and they came to trust me and appreciate what I was doing, and they suggested the research. And then when I told them that we were thinking about doing it, for like the past year, they're always sending me messages like, when can I send you my tissue? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa it's a much longer road here that has to get approved. They're excited about getting involved. They want to be involved. They want to know that they're suffering and what they're going through is going to make an impact for the future of medical care for that disease. They want to feel like they have meaning and purpose and that they can make something out of their disease that's not just negative and bad. It's very powerful to hear these patients talk about that that way. So I did partner with Dr. Williams and we did, we got a $50,000 grant from Pete Corey for patient-centered research. And um, we, we basically did a small study where we surveyed the DFSP group over a few weeks and we got 200 respondents who talked about how long they've been misdiagnosed, how many of them were told they had cysts. It's enormously more common. All sorts of rare sarcomas in the skin are told, oh, you just have a cyst, it's fine. And then five years later, they have biopsy and they're like, oh, actually, it's a DFSP or some other sarcoma. So the patients actually are research partners. When we publish the paper, their names, the small panel of patients that we select to help design the study, their names actually will be next to ours. That's amazingly important. And Pip said that to her is like, a, that's a, like a life goal to know that the group she started resulted in research that she'll have her name on, that she'll have some ownership of. To her, she said that's the most amazingly powerful thing, to know that their, her group isn't just helping other patients, it's actually changing medical research. It means a lot to these patients to know that they're, they're making a difference. And they actually helped us on the survey. I wish I would have taken a picture, but on through Skype, patients from England and Canada and the US and Australia were meeting with my resident, helping <coughs> hash out the details of what questions to ask on a survey about their own disease. It gives me goosebumps still to, to have seen that happen. I was like, I never would have imagined this. Even two years ago, I would have had no idea I would ever see something like this happen. It's powerful to see that happen. And again, they're co-authors of the manuscripts. What about crowdfunding? So Brian Rubin, like I said, is one of the only basic science researchers in the world researching uh, epithelial and angioma epithelioma. He's raised three quarters of a million dollars. I was wrong. He's come up a lot since the last time I checked. And not all of that is from the group, but the EAG group, they drive hard his research. They, they ask all their family and friends to support this, donate to this. He is the only guy who's going to make a difference long term for our disease. Because until there's a mouse model, no one's going to spend time investing in a drug to cure this. And he's the only person in the world that probably can make a mouse model. That's what he wants to, and that's what he's trying to do. And when he needs tissue samples, they use that group to recruit people to send him samples. It's really incredible. And he doesn't even use social media. So I know you can say, oh, great, I don't have to. I'm really, 
but you got to have a, a group that knows you and is, so he's famous already. So the head of the group has a kid with EHE and has a very vested interest in wanting to find a cure because she was, wants her kid to be cured. So she goes to ASCO, she goes to oncology meetings, she knows all sorts of literature, she constantly talks to him. She's a type A driven person, but she gets stuff done and she helps him raise money for his research. If that doesn't make you think about social media, I don't know what will. All right, so we got an IRB approval recently to actually do a large prospective study of these DFSP patients, not just a little survey about how they feel about their disease and, and what they've gone through, but where we'll actually have Tissue sent to us, we'll review all of it, we'll look at the pathologic characteristics, and then we'll follow up the patients 5, 10, 15 years from now via Facebook. So I don't know about you, but I've spent hundreds of hours making phone calls trying to track down patients with rare tumors, and half of them are lost to follow up because their doctor died or retired or the records are lost or there was a flood or any number of things. Facebook's forever, man. People keep their accounts, most people. And so you just send them a message, hey, are you still doing well? Do you have a recurrence? You know, and you can always hash it out on email in more detail if you want, but you can use this to find a way to get in touch with people, even if their email's changed, their phone number's changed. It may be, depending on how many people enroll, there's over a thousand people in the group now. It may be the largest prospective study of DFSP ever done in the English literature. It's certainly the only one done via Facebook. I think journals will find that interesting, but it will take us some time to get done. All right, finally, I'm gonna talk, give you this story. Jasmine Haller, my second year med student, asked me last year, can I do an honors summer research project? And I said, well, I've been wanting to actually survey sarcoma groups and see how they like having a pathologist involved. They tell me they like it and that's useful. And I tell people that, but people say, well, Jared, you know, he's that crazy social media guy. He just says this. And, you know, so I said, well, let's get some real data, not anecdotal evidence. So we designed a survey. And Jasmine recently had this accepted as a platform presentation at USCAP, and, um, and she presented it. So we got 541 people to respond to our survey about Pathologist involvement in sarcoma and rare soft tissue tumor patient support groups. Pretty cool stuff. So here's two quotes from people from the angiosarcoma group. So the first one said, I went for more than 30 years without meeting another person with angiosarcoma. In this group, this is my tribe. These are my people. I belong here. And this patient, down, this person down here, who I've actually met in real life, um, when I was in Seattle, she asked if she could have lunch with me. So she and her husband and I sat for four hours um, and talked about mom's diagnosis, we talked about what it was like to go through that, we talked about having kids, about random stuff in life. It was a really powerful experience. She asked if she could meet me. So she said it was bizarre and isolating to have never met another person with that diagnosis and even though she was hesitant at first, she was very glad to find this group and to watch how this is having an impact on the future of medicine. So here are just some of the groups that we were involved in in the study, not even all of them. Desmoid 1,400 members, Angiosarc, 2,200 members, Ewing sarcoma, chondrosarcoma, aggressive angiomic sum, which is in a sarcoma, but you know, it's a, it's a soft tissue tumor that's rare and often recurrent. DFSP, there are a couple DFSP groups actually. EHE. So just those groups, there's 7,500 patients with very, very rare tumors that most doctors in practice will never see in their life, and most pathologists only see very occasionally unless they're in soft tissue pathology. <coughs> So here's what we did. We wanted to educate patients, but I learned from these patients, like I told you. The patients said it was useful, so we wanted to formally assess that and see. What's the, can we get some real data here that we can use, some real numbers of how useful the patients really think it is? So what we did is we used a, designed a hierarchical, hierarchical survey with SurveyMonkey. Normally that's free. We paid 75 bucks to get advanced analytics to give us more, more granular detail. We surveyed 12 groups, six of them that I was in, and six that had basically no or very minimal pathologists involved. I might have posted it once, so there might be another pathologist that had posted once or something. And we wanted to compare, that was kind of our control group. So we posted a survey of these groups. We got permission from, obviously, from our IRB, and then also, and they found this to be IRB exempt, actually, because again, it was, these are not our patients. These are not from our medical record. These are patients on Facebook uh, who want to be surveyed. So we asked, it, asked the administrator of each group, is this okay? And all of them said, oh yeah, that's fine, once we showed them what we were gonna be asking, and they thought it was great. So you, again, you have to get kind of buy-in from the group before you do things like this. So those are the groups. The ones on the left are the ones that I really actively participate in, and then on the right are the uh, some other ones that are kind of our control group. And here's the response to me now. We have 541 people to respond. 75% of those are actual patients. The rest were caregivers or parents of, of children with sarcomas. Uh, 400 patients. I would posit to you that even the largest and most active cancer centers in the world cannot get 400 <coughs> sarcoma patients to respond to a survey about pathologists in three weeks' time. 
no way. Right? They may have this many patients, but it's going to take them a long time to contact all those people, and they're going to have the same problems with, oh, well, you know, their last visit was two years ago, and then their phone numbers changed. People are on Facebook. This is how you access them. You can say, well, to buy a sample. It is, but so is a third, third a referral, a, a quaternary referral center has bias. A consult service has bias. There's bias always. You just have to deal with that bias and, you know, recognize that it's there. 85% were female, and that may have something to do with there's a higher percentage of females who use Facebook. Slightly higher, not that much higher. Peak age range was 35 to 54. So we asked them questions like this. Who makes the final diagnosis of cancer? So I thought that this would be really interesting to see. So about 70% recognize it was a pathologist, which is pretty good. But surprisingly, I always thought surgeons would be the ones that'd say, no, they think oncologists know how to diagnose cancer. And that might have something to do with the fact that only 80% of them thought that we were doctors. <laughs> these, are, these are slides that Jasmine presented, so we helped her come up with it, but she did a lot of the previous graphics. So we said our pathologists important part of the patient care team. And both groups recognized, both groups with the pathologists involved that I was in, and the groups that didn't have a pathologist involved, they both said, yeah, definitely. But actually, so even though this difference doesn't seem big, it was actually statistically significant. It seemed like the groups that had a pathologist involved, more people thought that pathologists were important for patient care. So we then asked the pathologist that in the groups I was involved in, hey, did you read or remember reading any of Dr. Gardner's posts? And about half of them said yes, the other half didn't. So we asked the ones that did remember it how they felt about actually the posts that I made in the group. So we said, did it help you better understand your disease? 90% said yeah, it did. We asked, did it actually help you understand what pathologists do for patient care? A small number, but still 74% said that they thought it helped, and only a small number disagreed with that. Don't know why, but maybe I should be See, 100% is the only number that's enough for me, right? I don't want any negatives. All right, so pathologists did it actually, because this is what I, some of them anecdotally have said, it actually helped relieve my anxiety. When a patient says, can I pass on DFSP to my kid? And I say, no, that's never been reported to my knowledge. They worry about that every night and they're gonna give their kid cancer because they hear about heritable cancer syndromes. And to tell them, no, DFSP is, to my knowledge, not linked to any of those. And your kid shouldn't have any higher risk than you do, as far as we know in the literature. That doesn't take any risk. That takes a minute of my time. And that brings enormous amount of relief and anxiety to that patient. So we asked them, does it actually help? And 77% said, yeah, it did help receive, relieve some of my disease-related anxiety by having a pathologist post and comment um, about our, our cancer. And so we asked, overall, did you think it was a good thing to have a pathologist in this group? And 98% of people said yes. You can't get 98% of people to say yes about anything, even about like, the color of the sky. I was really honored and, and kind of blown away by that. That tells me that this is what patients want. A large group of patients across a broad sample said, yes, we like having a pathologist in our group. They want this. And so we asked them, do you want that pathologist involved? 77% said, yeah. We asked the other groups if they wanted that. And even the groups that didn't have a pathologist said, yeah, we do. Most of them did. And the majority were just unsure because they hadn't had any experience with that yet. We said, do you want to have other physicians involved? And many of them said, yes, again, still a large subset were unsure about that. But the specialties that they said they would like to have is they said they'd like to have oncology, surgery, and radiology. Maybe they need radiation therapy, we're not sure. But those are kind of three of the, the bigger requests that they have. They, they want to have doctors involved in their group. So our conclusions with that patient, having a pathologist involved helps patients understand that we're important for patient care. Most of them thought it was good, and most of them wanted to have more of us involved and felt that it helped them better understand the disease and to relieve even anxiety about the disease. I mean, in a way, that's a form of healing. We often feel that as pathologists, because we don't treat, we can't heal. But there are other forms of healing that don't involve treatment or cure, and we can't participate in that in, in an unconventional way, maybe, but it makes it a death for the patient. So again, the most phenomenal thing to me was I couldn't believe that we got this many patients to respond to a survey on Facebook about how they, as sarcoma patients, thought about pathologists. To me, I was like, Jasmine, we could publish just that one page. We had this many patients respond to a survey. This is a viable form of conducting research. I mean, that's all. I said, whatever they said doesn't really even matter. Like, that's amazing. Yeah, I, was, I had no idea that many people would respond. So imagine, you know, let's do a little thought experiment. You know, use cap deadlines coming up. You're like, oh, I've got to find some tumor to, you know, slap an immunostate on and uh, present at the meeting. <clears throat> deadlines in 14 days. So you're quickly searching through, you know, looking and, you know, the search runs for 24 hours. And finally, you get you're frustrated, but eventually the results come in. You get 17 cases, but 10 were checked out in 2009. My retired faculty member doesn't use email anymore, right? That's frustrating. Your sample size has been killed now, and then you're running out of time for your deadline. 
You know, think back to that group of a thousand patients with whatever rare tumor, not just DFSP, any rare tumor of your choice. And imagine you had those patients at your fingertips. What would you do with access to that kind of information? What would those patients think having access to a pathologist at their fingertips through Facebook? How would they view our specialty differently if they had more people involved that actually showed them, hey, we care what you have to say. We want to be involved in the future of your disease with you as partners with us. Would that change their view that all we do is CSI, all we do is forensics, all we do is autopsies? Would that make them think that, hey, these guys are doctors who actually care about patients and care about the future and care about making a difference? That's what they tell me. They said that it matters and that they like this. One of the patients said that we benefit tremendously from having a pathologist in our group and they want more pathologists to join. And finally, I'll share this. This picture was taken last night. I had dinner with Phil Cagle and Maren McCool, and afterwards, uh, Dave and his daughter, Allie, uh, his wife died from angiosarcoma, and a year ago he shared a picture of, of her, half of her face eaten away by angiosarcoma, and I showed it at the TSP meeting last year. And I emailed him afterwards and I said, I showed a room of pathologists who have seen graphic things, this picture, they will never forget that is the face of angiosarcoma, and they will remember that. And he wrote me back this very touching email and said, thank you so much, This I've been crying because this, you know, this is anguishing emotion to see what my wife went through, but to know that some of it has purpose, is it brings joy, it brings some degree of healing. And his daughter said the same thing, said this is to know that she went through this, we wish it wasn't, she wasn't my mom who had to tell the story, but the fact that you're telling the story and making a difference and in fact, it makes it somehow a little bit better and a little bit less painful. And Lori also lost her husband to cardiac angiosarc, and Lori and Dave are now, now dating, and I think it's really, it's, a touching thing that come from a very sad background. They actually drove to Little Rock from Houston to visit me and stay with my family for a weekend. Um, I talked to them more than I've talked to many of my coworkers at my own hospital. I feel like I know them better than some of the people I work with. That sounds scary, right? They're normal people who suffered through something really bad. And the fact that they saw that there was a thought in the group who really was trying to change this for the future, that meant something to them. So that they went out of their way. One of the patients came and found me at Disney World and said, I want to meet you just for a minute. Can I just meet you? I was kind of blown away. I was like, I'm just this a random guy. But they care, not because I'm an expert, not because I know about angiosarcoma, circumstances, but because I'm taking the time to promote their cause and to raise advocacy for the disease. This is the future of what we can do with social media for pathology. I'll take any questions. I've not even thought to ask, and the patients probably haven't even thought about, but that kind of collaboration could definitely make, you could, you could find ways to do that that have not even been tapped yet. Because if you asked me like a year ago would I be talking about this today, no, I would have had no idea. A year before that, I wouldn't even thought I would have met one angiosarcoma patient in real life, let alone that people would come find me at Disney World to talk to me. So if you ask me what's going to happen a year from now, will we be doing that kind of, we, the sky's the limit. I mean, there are people here that you can interact with and you can find ways to be innovative and to, to even fulfill some of the government rules. And I don't know how to do those things yet, but I think that there's potential there, sure. Yes, ma'am. Do you run into patients in different groups that, that are members trying to like, frame you and a personal? Yeah, and I'm okay with that. So you have to decide. I'm, I'm a very open person and I keep my personal face. I mean, other than the pictures of my kids and um, you know, cocktails and food and travel. I mean, that's really it. So I have a, live a pretty open life. Some people have a very hard line between their personal and, and um, work life. And some people like me have a very blurred line and you just have to decide what you're okay with. And just you just don't accept those requests. It's okay. I mean, I get too many friend requests that I can't even keep up with accepting them now from people, pathologists all over the world. So, you know, no one seems to give me a hard time about that. I've never had a patient give me a hard time about that. But yeah, many of them have. And again, I feel like I'm friends with many of these people. And we talk about lots of things that are not related to their tumor. To me, that's cool. To some people, that's very scary and you wouldn't want that. But I've never had anyone give me problems for not accepting a friend request. The only, in fact, the only problem person I've ever run into was actually another pathologist on social media who's <laughs> probably got a bit of a personality issue. So anyway, but you know, there, those people abound, you know, they're out there. But I've never run into a patient because you know what? A patient will complain. They come and pay you a small copay and then your parking lot's not big enough. 
but they won't complain when they know you have three young kids and you're working an academic career and you're taking five minutes at 11 o'clock at night to answer one of their questions. They will wait patiently and they will be thankful for anything. You, no one has ever complained. Like, why didn't you respond quicker? Why didn't you? Never. Not once. You have all of these patients because there's a very different feeling. Even though that copay is nothing right, they feel somehow mm. obligated, like that doctor didn't take care of me like they should. They don't feel like that with me because they realize I'm giving them my spare time doing something that, that's really meaningful to them. So I feel like that's, there's a very big difference there that, that makes them feel much more grateful about what we're doing. Right? Um, so when I come to histology and, and seeing slides and stuff, I get it. It's pretty easy to be identify that it's not uh, something that is very important. But when it comes to gross injuries, this right. is a big topic for us to get. And we have a lot of people that really want to share interesting gross injuries. But we've had a lot of kickback from pathologists, other physicians, even, even just people in general that is feeding a morbid fantasy of yeah, sure. I've heard those things. And, you know, Miss Ann Jenny is a PA on, on uh, Instagram has three quarters of a million followers. Right. And she posts autopsy photos and things that are somewhat controversial, but if they're very educational and stuff that the public wants to see. There probably are people that are morbidly curious, but I think there are also people that are recognizing this is an important job that some people do. So I think it's a good thing. And, and give it a few months, I'll have a paper for you to cite. I'm writing a paper with uh, Eve Crane, who's a fellow at Hopkins, and we were invited to write a review of the ethics of posting pathology images on social media. And we're going to cover that. I believe it's personally okay as long as you're very careful. The way I look at de-identification is A, the rules are the same as publishing in a medical journal. And someone said to me, but you have to get patient permission. I mean, how many of you really get patient permission before you post case reports? If you do, it's only because your institution requires it or the journal. It is not a HIPAA rule. HIPAA has its rules posted online that you can go read. And most people who say that's not HIPAA compliant don't really understand HIPAA. And so I usually advise them to go and study and then come back and discuss with me some more. And it never happens. So the, um, the other thing is that if I have a really you know, graphic specimen, make sure there's no tattoos, make sure if there's a clinical picture, there's no background or a thing that might be recognizable, I'll crop things out. Um, the other thing is if I have a, you know, a vulvectomy or something, I'm not gonna post it that same day. I might wait six months. I make sure to wait. I always alter the age, always. By death, I will always say this is a 30-year-old if they're 32. I might say man versus woman, not if it's a vulvectomy, but if it's maybe a leg or something, right? I, that way, if anyone comes to me, I'll say I always alter. I don't even remember what the real age of this patient is. So how do you know who this patient is? I never say today I had the case of this. It's very tempting, right? Oh, today I had two chondromyxoid fibromas. Statistically, this should never happen. But I don't do it because the date is an identifier. So I don't say it or the patient's from here. Make up things. It's okay to make little white lies on behalf of patient privacy. I'm happy to commit that sin in the, in the, the behalf of the patient protecting their privacy. So, so far I've not run into any problems. I agree with you though that there is a bit more concern about gross images. But again, if you're very careful and you just what I usually the rule I say is if someone comes and says you're violating HIPAA here, I'll say, okay, tell me the name of the patient whose privacy I violated. <laughs> if they can't answer that question with someone's name, then I've not violated any rules. But do make sure that you don't violate institution rules. Some institutions have very draconian rules about social media. I understand why they have them. It doesn't make them right. But um, you know, you can't get fired for violating a policy, whether it's against the law or not, it doesn't matter. If you violate the policy of your university, no matter how stupid it may seem, you gotta follow the rules, right? Even I as a as a Design. I want to be a rule breaker and a rebel, but in the end, I follow the rules because I don't want to get fired. You should do that too, especially residents. <laughs> yes. So institutional policies do prohibit something. So then don't, right? Yeah. And have, has there been any look at in pathologist organizations to have sort of an intermediary that you know, you know, you can send something to them is basically cut off from whoever sent it? That's a great idea. So I kind of use that personally. The other thing I do is when people say, well, you're posting this, I'm like, I have pictures and cases from Korea, from South America, from Africa, things sent to me from all over the world. Again, you don't even know where this specimen came from, let alone that, who the patient is. So I, get, I go out of my way to say that, that I have, and I have a friend who is a pathologist in a third world, or I'm sorry, a dermatologist in a, in a foreign country where she's, for her, for her safety, trying to kind of not let it be known exactly. So I've told her, modify where you say the pictures are from. And the fact that you know you're getting pictures from other places, it makes sure that people know that, like I'm sharing pictures from all over the place, that helps to kind of, again, minimize and dilute any possible ability that someone might think they have to identify a specimen. And I do actually put a higher standard on social media than on published literature, because even though the published literature is not HIPAA compliant, we somehow think it's magical and safe just because there's a paywall there. Patients can go to the library and access any journal article in the world, okay? It's not a safe place to post patient identifiers. 
So social media, though, is a little more accessible, so I hold a, a higher standard. Again, HIPAA is not what I care about. Patient privacy is what I care about. So I'll go above and beyond HIPAA for the sake of protecting privacy if need be. But it's a great question, and I think it's an evolving area of ethics. I personally feel it's okay as long as you're very careful and conscientious to think about how you would want it to deliver your leg or your, your wife or kids' body parts. How would you want that, and how are you representing that image, and for what purpose? I think most people would recognize that I spend a lot of time to educate, and I'm certainly not there for, for you know, uh, you know, morbid fascination purposes. And, and I think that people view things very differently when they realize that. When you put and invest in the time to show people that you're doing it for the greater good. Dr. Allen. Yeah, Ray, we continue to grow right here in this institution. Like one says, the virus is shy and developing and so on. <laughs> still a little shy. We are all very proud of you. You have become a bright star, like we didn't expect it. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. Happy to surprise you. We know you have an incredible amount of energy. So tell me, how do you manage? <laughs> to do all these things because I know people like Mary Schwartz that sleep three hours and then. Well, I sleep four hours. Right or five. Or five. <laughs> I do sleep less probably than some people do, but you've got to find a way to. You have to find your priorities, right? What's important to you? So, what's important to me is to make sure I don't sacrifice my relationship with my wife and my kids for the sake of my career. Never. It's not worth it. So I try to make sure that when I come up from work, I spend time with them. I used to be a night owl, and I worked at night. Now I don't. I get up at 4 in the morning, and I work on projects and PowerPoints, and I work on planes, and I do tweeting when I'm in line at the grocery store, or when I'm waiting to get lunch, or when I have, you know, a minute, or when I'm walking down the hall, you know, people advise against that. You know, someone told me the other day, you're going to get fined for that one day. I was like, oh, okay. But, you know, i got to do it. got to do it when I can do it. So you just find time to fit it in, and you don't all have to do as much of this. I mean, I feel like this is, like, the right place at the right time, and that if I push this, this could make a difference for the whole specialty, and that's why I feel like it's worth investing my time in, even if it means taking some sacrifices right now and other things. I want to push harder, because eventually my goal is that all of you will be doing this, and it will change the field and change the future of the way that we are viewed as, as, medical, uh, as medical physicians and as, as people who provide patient care. So, yeah, you just have to, I don't watch TV. I watch TV with my wife occasionally, but I don't watch TV. I used to play video games. I don't do that anymore. I've given up some of those hobbies because I want to spend more time with my kids, and I want to do this because I think this is meaningful, and this is something I'll look back on at the end of my life and think this was worth my time. Jonathan. So what you talked about Facebook Is it not peer-reviewed then? I don't know. I, I think that most people in the traditional publishing spheres would say that's crazy. But if you have peer reviewers that are well-known experts in their field, why is that wrong? I mean, there are people that have open access journals, and some of them are you know, scammy, and some of them are real legitimate. So I don't know. I think that certainly that could happen over time. It would have to be done the right way, and, and I think that it just takes a bright young mind like yours to go out there and do it. Jonathan's also one of the administrators on uh, my soft tissue. The New York Times just had an article on that about two weeks ago, what oh, you're just right. talking about, oh, cool. um, where some of the even the top line journals are getting aced out because their best authors are going ahead and doing this kind of thing and just publishing it within their own little peer review group, and that's it. Yeah. Why wait? To, you know, it can be a right. year. Why wait that long and go through all the you know the hurdles when this is quicker? And if there's something I want to share that's not research, but it's you know say an editorial or commentary, I just write it on my Facebook page. It's public. It's like a website. People can share it, they can read it, and I just put it out there and I kind of self-publish it. I can put that, some of that stuff on my CV under like non-peer-reviewed, but again, it's, if it's an editorial, it's not peer-reviewed anyway, really. I mean, it's not like peer-reviewed research. So if, the, if it really matters to have an extra line on my CV, I mean, I got plenty of lines on my CV. I'm, I'm publishing five to 10 peer-reviewed papers a year that I'm co-author on. I mean, I'm doing, and the reason I do that is mainly so that I can look at the p and committee and be like, ha-ha, I'm doing what you say, plus the social media stuff. So it's really for this kind of sense of, satisfaction that I'll have hopefully in saying you can do both and I'll still do the legitimate stuff plus this. So um, maybe maybe that's an internal problem. My wife will have to sort out with me. But um, anyway, <laughs> I, I think yeah, I think that that's really an area that's probably right for looking into for sure. There are new ways to share information and we should be harnessing those to get the ideas. 
something. Well, I don't want to keep you any longer. Thank you very much for your time. And you can always find me online if you have any more questions. <laughs> Thank you.